Roscoe was just a little bit too slow. He wasn't sure if he had partaken of one too many home-cooked meals by his safe hearth at home. He wasn't sure if perhaps it had been too long since he had last stepped out from his comfortable community along the heady river to engage in a little adventuring of his own. He wasn't sure if it was just his utter failure as a friend and as a hero. It may have been some combination of these things, or simply the overall futility of having been completely out-evolved by the massless orbs of Visicorp's hunter team. All that mattered now was Roskoll had been caught. Dan, Hans, and Savannah seemed to have escaped for now. But was there really any escape from the seemingly omniscient control of Visicorp? It was this morbid thought that made Roskoll wonder if it was even worth it at all. Had he just been captured for nothing? He looked to bolden himself, and in doing so, his sharp mind reasoned that this is exactly what Visicorp wanted, another one of their systems of control. It went along with their cameras, their constant medical screenings, their massive towers, even, he thought, the entire notion of the Five at all. If the citizens of Hopeport and beyond could be so locked in this fear, then it didn't really matter anymore whether or not it was entirely truthful, or if there was just a man behind the curtain controlling all of the smoke and mirrors. The tentacles that had been holding his arms and legs locked suddenly tightened, he could sense anger in the four hunters that the rest of his party had eluded them. He suddenly realized that he would not be so lucky as Dan. Dan hauled safely away to what seemed now to be the friendly shadows of the pickles looming behind him. The very reason Roscoe was here now, and by deduction, the very reason he was caught. As more arms of the remaining hunters began to wrap around his limbs and torso, he knew it was not the time to waste his thoughts on determining if he blamed Dan for his predicament. He also decided that Visicorp no longer deserved his thoughts now either. Snakes wrapped themselves around his bushy tail and pulled with a force that he didn't believe could have existed from something so small that could float in the air. His tail ripped from his body and tore with it a strip of skin up along his spine. His scream was immediately silenced by a score of tendrils gagging any sounds he could make. He could feel the cold autumn wind on his exposed gash along his back. It would have been a stinging pain were his brain not preoccupied by his left leg now being ripped from his body. He thought back to his days as a young squirrel with his brothers running up to the northernmost reaches of the Fairchild Plains, where the heady began to break off into a labyrinth of lesser rivers and creeks, and sabotage the homes of the badgers just for the thrill of it. He thought to his mother, and how frustrated yet fearful she would be that her dear children would get caught. Roscoll knew differently in his youth that he was invincible, and no badger alive would be able to match his speed. His arm tore off on his right side. He turned to look at it and watched the blood spray in all directions. It looked fake to him for some reason, although truthfully he wasn't sure what to expect. He had never seen a creature dismembered before, much less himself. He was so numb to the pain now that he realized he ought to be reacting to it several seconds after his lifeless limb touched the ground. The hunters being not much more than what looked like the eyes plucked out of some poor soul, only several times larger in size, with red and blue veins trailing off behind them like so many flagella floating causelessly in the air, were seemingly always giving off a faint buzzing noise, but had now somehow amplified this noise slowly more and more throughout their macabre process of fatally torturing their prisoner. The tendrils now wrapped around his neck, and Roskull knew what came next. He made absolutely sure that his final conscious thought was of Irva.